So when I'm out at um, at Great Salt Lake, I'm often thinking about Mars. And so I want to take us there. Um, I'm gonna share this. And I'm really gonna talk about a little bit of biology and a little bit about why Great Salt Lake applies to Mars. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my collaborator, Scott Pearl, who is at NASA. So he's an hour earlier, um, which means he has to wait on his wine. Um, but he will talk about how this actually transitions to rovers on Mars and the current project that's going on. Jamie and I are very excited and we're hosting um, a watch party with John, John Armstrong, uh, the director of Op Planetarium, who uh, is just a little bit north of us. Um, we're very excited about February 18th, so I hope you guys look into that. So let me tell you about why life at Great Salt Lake matters when we think about potential life on Mars. Um, so Jamie showed this picture and I love it because it puts Great Salt Lake in the context of the planet. And you can think about, yeah, the earth and there's that causeway, that railroad causeway that segments the water, the north arm water away from the south arm water and prevents a lot of input. And that means that that water gets saltier and saltier and richer and richer in minerals. Um, but you also can see in this picture, the Bonneville salt flats. Um, so this was a giant system um, uh, over, an, uh, over the last 800,000 years, the lake has mostly looked like Great Salt Lake, but there have been four large lake periods. And the last of those was um, about 30,000 to 15,000 years ago. So that's what we talk about as Lake Bonneville. So a lot of people start the history of Lake Bonneville and say, oh, Great Salt Lake is a remnant of Lake Bonneville. So I want to just suggest to you that actually Great Salt Lake is the norm and the large lake episodes have been um, abnormal. But the last one we had um, was indeed uh, Lake Bonneville, and it left behind this what we call evaporite. Geologists put it the end of everything to make it a rock. So it is basically a rock left behind from something that evaporated. So this is a mineral bed um, that's mostly sodium chloride because that's the, the nature of Great Salt Lake and this basin. Um, so Bonneville salt flats, if uh, those of you who are local have certainly driven west to Nevada. Um, and if you drive west on I-80, you see uh, this kind of landscape. It's absolutely beautiful and it really does look otherworldly. So this is a salt flat and it's not unlike what we see in places around Mars. Of course, it's covered in iron dust, so it's red, but there are lots of, um, of uh, evaporates where lakes used to be. And, and so Scott and I like to talk about this as an analog, as a place on our planet that looks like places on Mars. Um, and they are analogous, if you will, to places on Mars. This is another ISS picture by the same astronaut uh, from ESA. I love this guy. Uh, he did some amazing photography. This is where um, Scott and I have done a lot of work um, around that area that if you've been to Spiral Jetty, you've been to this Roselle Point area. This is where the Tar Seeps people were also talking about. Um, so we've done work in the water and in the salts on the shore. Um, so geologists, um, as a biologist, you start to work with geologists and they have a really different language. And one of the things they do, it's kind of funny, when I started going to geology talks, I was like, who are these geologists? They always, they always put themselves in the picture, you know? Are they, are they that um, pompous that they think they should have pictures of themselves in all of their manuscripts? But actually they use humans for scale. So that's a really common thing in geology is to have something in the picture that gives you scale. In microbiology, we use a little scale bar in, you know, maybe in the micron range. Um, so I always think it's funny when you read a geology paper and they say humans for scale. So I have my own take on that. This is my um, 1977 um, Chewbacca. Um, and I, I say Wookiee for scale. And I actually just snuck this through a publisher. So this picture 
my students and I decided needed to be published. Um, we didn't mention George Lucas in the credits, so I'm hoping we don't get sued. But anyway, uh, he is actually exactly 10 centimeters, so he makes for an excellent scale bar. But I want to show you that the salt around the Wookiee's feet um, is pink. And that's common in these hypersaline evaporate regions where the salt water has evaporated. It got saltier and saltier and saltier. And then it evaporated and only water evaporates. Only water goes into the water cycle, right? So the salts get left behind. And that is what we think happened on Mars or also on the planet where the Wookiees are from, but that's another story. Um, so I'm going to call these halophiles, and this comes from the Greek meaning salt lovers. And in this diagram of the three domains of life, halophiles are here under archaea. And most people think of halo archaea as the halophiles, but um, uh, you grow them on plates and they're these beautiful, rich pink and orange colors. And that's what makes the water of the North Arm the color it is um, like that. And I also want to mention that there are some bacteria that are also halophiles, and there are some also eukaryotic algae and protists that are halophiles. So I don't want to leave those domains of life out, but most of the conversation in my talk, the next few slides, is going to be about haloarchaea, just so you know. But halophiles is a broader term, and I will use that term from now on because halo means salt. It's the Greek version of SAL, HAL was the Greek version of the Latin SAL, where we get salt and salary and salad and all those words. So um, that root should start to be common to you. Um, so we do find halophiles in this pink water. We find lots of them. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to my collaborator, Swati Almeida Delmet. Um, she worked with uh, Carol Litchfield, who was one of my early mentors in the halophile community. Um, and she passed away a few years ago. And I um, worked with Swati to finish some of her research that she did with Carol. Um, so you don't need to know the legend of the figure on the bottom right. All that means is every color is a different uh, genus of microbes that lived in Great Salt Lake, in this case, just Archaea. So we sampled over time and you just saw a different spread of the microorganisms every time you went to the lake. And I, I think these over time kind of longitudinal studies are really important. The point I wanna to make to you, a more general audience, is, is that this Great Salt Lake North Arm it is salinity at saturation. The water is holding as much salt as it can hold, and we still have abundant life. We have abundant life, and, uh, and we have diverse life. So that should tell us that in a salt flat on Mars, if life could be there, if life was there ever before, you know, it's possible that it could still be present. It could still live in those conditions. So shout out to Swati. Um, these halophiles have superpowers. And that's really what I wanna tell you about. They're part of a group of organisms we call extremophiles. And mostly we think of archaea when we think of extremophiles, but again, they're also bacteria and eukaryotes that can do extreme lifestyles. Um, and, and it is extremophiles that give us a window into the limits of life. Like how salty can life be? How hot can life be? How cold can life deal with? Um, and so these extremophile studies means that us microbiology sorts of people get lumped into astrobiology now because um, astrobiology cares when we think about life on other planets how cold is it that life can handle, right? That's an important question when you're talking about the habitability of Encephalus or Europa or Titan, some of these moons of Saturn or Jupiter. It's really important questions. Um, but again, tonight we're on Mars, so especially Mars. People used to say, Mars is too cold. Mars has too much radiation. Well, we have life on Earth that can handle all those things. So um, now we're really excited about this new mission, Perseverance, that will bring back samples. So some of the superpowers I'll list rather quickly. Uh, salt tolerance, you can see halophiles on the right 
growing on salt crystals. You can see pink halophiles on the left growing in salt ponds where water has been evaporated to produce salt. Um, the saltier it is, the better they do, no problem. Um, they have radiation resistance. Um, not only, uh, they also gamma radiation, but mostly we've talked about uh, UV radiation in some of the work that we've done. But, but they can handle lots of different sorts of radiation. That's really important. These pink pigments actually help collect free oxygen radicals that spin off from radiation assaults. So the, the, actually the colors of the organisms are really important in their biology um, and in helping them fend off the assaults of, of Earth in this case, or potentially Mars. Um, lifestyle flexibility. So this is from a chapter we just wrote and I have example references on the right. I wanna give a, a shout out to Aaron Oren who, um, Aaron, is, Aaron is in the audience and um, he uh, had a paper that talked about perchlorate reduction. Perchlorate salts are really important because they are found on Mars um, in the 1976 Viking mission, actually, we discovered perchlorate. So we've known about perchlorates for a long time. Um, those are thought to be reductive in really angry environments for microbes, but halophiles don't care. Um, there are halophiles that can deal with that. They can deal with broad pH uh, ranges, broad temperature ranges. They can deal without oxygen. They can use light energy to make ATP, even though they don't do photosynthesis. So they have this lifestyle flexibility, I call it. Um, they also have superpowers in that they can survive inside minerals over time. Um, I'm going to, um, hang on, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute just because I have, I have a piece of ancient salt in front of me and I wanna show it to you and see if you can see any inclusions inside. This is Permian salt that's 253 million years old. Um, inside are little fluid pockets. And it turns out that halophiles can survive over time in those fluid pockets. And these are actually pictures of that um, from Tim, Tim Lowenstein's lab. Um, and there are many researchers, there's probably, I, I think about 35, 40 papers uh, or more on long-term survival of halophiles in the geologic record. So let me just underscore how important this is. A microorganism can survive in a rock over time, over millions of years, okay? So if we leave minerals behind on Mars from evaporation and there were, in, there were microbes there, maybe they're still there, right? This is why we get excited. Um, so can Great Salt Lake halophiles be entombed in minerals? And Scott's gonna mention this as well, um, but I'll just give a little shout out to some of our Great Salt Lake minerals. We have sodium chloride, which we also call halite. We have gypsum. Um, some of you have collected these gypsum crystals around Great Salt Lake. Recently, Jamie and I have been involved in some studies on mirabilite. This is sodium sulfate. Um, and a question, are these minerals on Mars? So we have evidence that sodium chloride is there. We have evidence, particularly at, um, well, a number of places, but Jezero Crater, I wanna point to, because that's where Perseverance is going. And there is a signature from infrared data that gypsum is there. So in my lab, we're actually looking at some of these clay inclusions and the ability to hold on to life over time. Um, and uh, mirabilite, these crystals here, this is important. We don't know if mirabilite is on Mars, but we do know that the groundwater, this is a study from last year, that the, there, there is salty brine seeping in the subsurface groundwater. And that's exactly what happen, what happens to produce these mirabilite mounds at Great Salt Lake. Um, so there's some white reflective areas that could be mirabilite, but we don't know the composition of it yet. Um, so remember that Mars on the left today used to look like Mars on the right. It used to look more like Earth. Um, 
And so 3.5 billion years ago, as we were developing life, Mars had an atmosphere. Um, and and the, the atmosphere started to dry up at that time. Um, they are started to disappear because of a magnetic shift and the surface water disappeared. So if, if Mars had life, it probably had microbial life and then it stopped evolution. So we, we don't think that there is gonna be giraffes and rhinoceros on, on Mars. We think that there could be microorganisms and they could be started at this time that Earth was, and Mars were very similar. It, as those lakes dried up, if there was life in those lakes, as those lakes dried up, they would have gotten more salty. And, and if, if the salt, if the water completely dried up, which it did on the surface, it would have left behind Bonneville salt flats, essentially. It would have left behind minerals. And we know that minerals can hold on to life. So if there was microbial life on Mars in the water that dried up, could it be in that mineral record that's left behind? So I think there's three possibilities. No life was ever on Mars. We don't have evidence for life yet. Or there was extant life, existing life that's still there now. There was life and it's still there. Or extinct life. So I think extant life is interesting, obviously, because it would be cool to find life on another planet. But extinct life is also really interesting because it means Earth isn't the only place that life um, actually evolved through a biogenesis. So I think that's really an important distinction. So if this life was halophilic, right? Life, um, life in that salt in that lake that dried up would have dealt with salt. Um, and evolved to live in high salt. As the lake shrunk, the minerals concentrated. So it had to be salty. That's what happened from the Lake Bonneville to Great Salt Lake transition. So halophiles could be entrapped in the ancient salt on Mars. The other option about extinct life means, A, maybe the cells aren't there, but we could look for their molecules. And of course, halophiles are these superbugs, so we're looking for extant life or we're looking for their biomolecules that they leave behind. Um, and so I'll just leave this with, I really think Great Salt Lake halophiles are good analogs for extreme life on Mars. And I, I wanna hear Scott Pearl from NASA JPL talk about this because he, He's so great um, at bringing this, like bringing this Great Salt Lake work and this Earth work to Mars.